Well, that's, um, that's a bit of a story. Probably going back a few years when uh, so I got my education back in Germany um, after my apprenticeship in farming. I was studying agriculture and uh, went to Australia for a year learning about real agriculture like shearing sheep and then big farming and I got aware of this um, you know, soil situation in the world so the soil fertility is declining and lots of soil erosion, salinity and I thought wow this needs to change this is not sustainable. Um, so back at university back in Germany I um, concentrated on soil science and plant nutrition because I wanted to find out what can I do to, to change this, to get the soils back to high fertility. Um, so I did my PhD on um, beneficial utilisation of organic resources on farmland um, to stop erosion and um, yeah, loss in soil fertility, organic matter back into the soils. So the my Noki journey started back in 2006 when I came to New Zealand starting working at a Crown Research Institute as the technical manager for the New Zealand Land Treatment Collective, um, which is a yeah, collective for looking at organic waste and how we apply this to land. It could be a liquid, effluent and, and solid. And the other part of my job was um, finding a solution for pulp and paper industry in New Zealand. Because they are producing 250,000 tonnes of a carbon fibre source which can't be utilised and has been either burned or uh, landfilled. So with my background in organic waste management on farmland and integrating this from a soil science perspective, I needed to come up with a technology how to put it back into soil because this was my, my true belief. And talking to some colleagues at the Research Institute, someone pointed me towards worm farming and I have never heard about worm farming. I was, as a soil scientist, walking on soil with millions of worms underneath over more than 10 years in the past. I never considered, heard about worm farming. So I had a look at the worm farm, put my hands in one of these worm farms and was holding this worm casting. And if compost is black gold, worm casting are black raw diamonds. And the challenge was, taking it from a bathtub worm farm into an industrial scale worm farm for 250,000 tonnes of organic waste out of landfills from pulp and paper industries. This is how it started. Looking at the worms, trying to understand what's going on here and uh, starting my journey. So the next step was kind of, as a scientist, you do the background check, checking out new, um, journals and, and um, scientific research and there's been a lot of research done back in the 1980s doing exactly what I needed to do but in a scale like two or three handful in a lab and I wanted to do it out in the open in, in integrated in farming management in the forest so we did some initial trials and then a year later we were out in the fields with full truck and trailer units of organic waste and starting this business um, and I actually had to leave my, my senior scientist role, living on my credit card and the income of my wife with great support and started this business and um, needed to collect a few worms and, and here I am, largest worm farm in the world. It started all with some trials in the lab, so I took some organic waste from the paper industry, from, from our municipal wastewater treatment plants called biosolids and some milk sludge, a bit of lake weeds and um, put it together and were feeding it to worms. And, well, uh, I could repeat exactly what the other scientists, scientists did 20 years earlier. So I said, well, let's jump this prototype and, 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 and small scale, just go straight into real business. So we took a truck and trailer of each of these waste and mixed it and put it out in nature and watching the worms, how they do it. Um, I was a great success straight away and then the largest pulp mill industry said, well, can you do this? And um, so I went back to management and said, well, I need to set up this large trial and, um, and, and to make it work. And they, they actually declined it. They said, well, there's probably not enough IP in worm farming. Well, I bit my credit card actually and my wife was full supportive and, and, and um, paying the day-to-day -day bills. And I took on a one-year challenge with this paper mill and to set up a trial. 
gathering 20 buckets of worms somewhere around the edges of their landfill and, and, and set up my first worm farm. And uh, so one year contract came to a second year contract and then first councils came on board looking at uh, the organic waste and so one came to the other. So the first year 20 buckets of worms, like 7,000 tons of waste and uh, and uh, a lot of time went by. This was back in 2007, so 15 years. And I calculated the time, that's about 35,000 hours on the job on worm farming, plus another 25 on, um, yeah, soil science. And combining all these time it's probably um, gave me a huge advantage about others and, and understanding how, how this works. But I'm probably an expert in, in communicating with the worms if so to speak, and, and, and make sure they actually are supported in what nature designed them to do so. So if you like what we're doing, it's an entertainment business. So it's about um, having a big party for the worms, providing the best food available. So we take this, all the organic waste, mix it nicely, so we have a cool buffet for the, for the worms and then we have beautiful rainwater from New Zealand and uh, that's all we do. But it's kind of finding out what do the guys need to make it work. So I want to work with nature and it's, it's pretty amazing how it all comes together. Yeah, that's uh, pretty good technology. It's kind of listening to the worms. Uh, though I've got a hearing aid and unfortunately it's not tax deductible when listening to the worms, but um, it's about watching them. So when we do these trials and creating this perfect feedstock or food for the worms. It's like, like your sandwich, you have your butter, uh, your bread, your butter, a bit of lettuce and maybe some jam or some chicken. Um, so we do the same for the worms. So we're combining um, paper waste, um, food waste, milk sludge, bar solids, leg weeds to create the perfect food. And then we present it to the worms. So the worms need to come to the party. We can't force them coming in. Imagine 85 hectares of worm farm and you want to put a worm pool fence around it to force them eating it. It doesn't really work. It's a whole team. We try to find out what do the guys need to make work, make these work. So it's first the party, the worms need to love it. Second is our uh, region councils. They need to give, give us a um, resource consent so we have a permit to do so. So meaning no pollution of the soil and groundwater no order emissions, so need to be safe. And the third one is we need a product farmers want to buy. So the worm casting, and this is where the soil scientist in me comes up, this casting is so amazing. This is what nature wanted us to do, to produce this product and keep it in the environment. But we are, we believe we were smarter than nature and we put all the organic resources into a landfill, calling it waste. And then we struggle. It smells, it releases greenhouse gas emission, methane, polluting groundwater, and we figure out, wow, this is not sustainable. Um, and then we're coming up with very expensive plants like thermal composting plants, which cost more than $200 per ton input if you build one, or anaerobic digesters. But rather than, we should have looked to the worms. How is nature doing dealing with it? Nature didn't build composting plants or anaerobic digesters. They just had earthworms. So we do the same. And um, listening to the worms and, and that's, yeah, yeah, I'm a worm listener rather than a whisperer. The business started in New Zealand and um, we had, when we started, called Eco Worm, which means eco, everything is eco nowadays and worm could be vermin or vermicomposting so that it doesn't fly, so we need to come up with a better name. So one of the first worm farms I set up was for uh, a trust at 40 hectares of glasshouses, 2,000 tons of organic waste from tomato and capsicum. I was very successful. And uh, the uh, Maori word for earthworm is noki. So we said, ah, noki. Okay, company is Noki Limited. It's all about the earth, earthworms and uh, we couldn't trademark it, so we came up with my Noki. So everyone can buy into it because it's, it's for everyone. We don't claim it as our technology. We want to help everyone having a worm farm at home, on the farm, at every paper mill, yeah, everywhere actually. 
Besides the environmental um, benefits or values we're driving, so we want to take organic waste out of the landfill to mitigate or reduce the greenhouse gas emission. Um, we want to integrate in farming, so the worm farm actually will be part of farm management. So we will have like 20 farms around New Zealand we're operating on. But it's more important to take care of our people in the company. So we call it our Mainoki way. So because people are very, very important. So we have to listen to the worms and, and watch them. So we can, we kind of adapt um, a more European style. So we offer a 13 year salary for Christmas. Um, we um, make sure that the retirement scheme is well looked after. So we match Kiwi Save up to 8%. So we want to encourage our staff, well look, um, make sure your retirement is looked after. We are not big enough to have a company driven a retirement scheme. Um, we want uh, people to have time with their families so we're extending our holidays so if you stay longer with us you come up to five weeks holiday plus all the holidays we have in New Zealand. Um, oh, there are so many other things we're doing for our staff and, and people. Safe machine is all the best machines on the ground so we're not mucking around with all tractors and fixing them and so we want to have best outcome. So another point is um, the environmental outcome. As we started this and we're probably a um, very early developer of industrial scale worm farming, there is no blueprint. So there is no manual how to do this. It was kind of, most worm farms are indoor or backyard worm farming with covered beds and you have a wheelbarrow and a shovel. So we take large loaders and, and we receive sometimes 700 tons a day easily. Um, so we need to need to incorporate it and of course when you start you don't get things 100% right. Um, we're always taking, taking notes of what we're doing and when we can see things need to be done better, we're improving it. So just to give you an example, um, so when we're putting those windrows out, out on the fields, uh, we need to be concerned about how do they appear, how do they look like in the environment because we want to integrate them. It's not just by moving around on farmland, but also they need to look nice. So we're now covering those windrows uh, with a bit of vermicast and then we're introducing plants like uh, red clover, phacelia. So actually flowers are growing on these windrows and then we're feeding the bees in winter. And this is so amazing. So these are kind of ideas we're constantly improving. Um, 10 years ago I started rotating of those windrows, meaning the worm farm itself is not on the same spot every year for decades. It's only there for one year and then we go to the next farm and we go to the next paddock and into the forest block where we just harvest some trees before we replant them. So it's kind of integrating. This means more soils will benefit from, from a worm farm because we are breeding worms, we're leaving some worm casting behind. So the soil fertility will be improved over time. Um, we need to get the recipes right. So I spoke about this sandwich party thing. That's one part. But we need to make sure when we have heavy rain events that we are not losing any of the nitrogen into the groundwater because we know this is important to have safe and clean groundwater and rivers and lakes in New Zealand. We, we truly want to com, uh, contribute to 100% pure New Zealand and this is part of it. I need to start with some worms, you know, it's, um, though worms are amazing, they can eat that body weight today. So for me this would be a bit more than 42 litre ice cream containers a day, so I would never be able to do this. But the worms actually can. But to process, let's say, 100,000 tonnes, you need a lot of worms. Um, so 20 buckets I was able to collect and that wasn't enough. So the first year we had a breeding program. And the worms luckily double in volume every two months. So now we have, I think, four billion worms by now, and we are processing more than 180,000 tons per year. So in the first year it was 7,000 tons, now it's 180,000 tons. And um, yeah, this is how we, how we developed and started. So the first worm farm was a couple of hectares, and, and now we have 85 hectares plus probably four times as much to rotate on, consented. We have four worm farms now and we are expanding.
If you're looking at a bathtub, and let's call it a square meter, so on a square meter, if you do it really right, you can have kind of um, 2,000 worms, um, so they can eat 2 kgs a day. That's, it's, that's a lot actually, so 2 kgs in a bathtub every day in a household, kitchen waste, that's what you need every household. But imagine we would take 180,000 tons of this and I don't know how many, how many bathtubs I would need and have a lid and put some food in and down and then collecting the worm casting. Now we, we, I, I skipped this, so I had my little trial in the lab and then I went straight out truck and trailer units and put it out in windrows on the farmland. And I think that was the smartest thing I came up with. And a year later I had my resource concerned and off we were. We when you start your, your, your business, you have a vision. You want to, want to improve soils, but you get started and you need to understand the technology. And, and over time I got aware that it's a huge potential. It's just not, uh, not just getting one paper mill organic waste free, which is a challenge on its own. But actually you can say, well, we can do so much more. So we have a large um, community city in the center of North Island. This is all organic waste free from their biosolids. So we take all the biosolids for oh, 11 years now. Um, so that's, that's a quarter of a million tons of biosolids processed. So we had to come up with a vision. And then I was asked, what is actually the vision? So our board of directors came up and said, what are we, what are we aiming for? And I said, to be bold, I want New Zealand organic waste free. So we are pro producing 200, 2 million tonnes of organic waste, we call it, according to the Ministry for the Environment. But I call it organic resources. And we need to put these back into the soil to produce more food, fodder and fibre. So my vision is, in three years' time, we not want to process only 180,000 tonnes per year. We are able to do a 1 million ton vermicomposting facilities around New Zealand. So meaning of the, we want to take half the organic waste out of landfills and put it into worm farms all over New Zealand, probably 18, 20 sites, including uh, Chatham Island. Um, and to give you a figure, this one million, this is a volume we have achieved last year in total. So growing constantly, um, one million ton out of landfill, that's amazing. And I think we are the largest organic waste processor in New Zealand. Not putting it into landfill and claiming we are turning it into methane, biogas. If we are looking at our resources, it's the nutrients and the carbon in our organic resources and due to nature, these need to go back into the topsoil, into the where we're growing our food, our fodder for our animals, where we're growing trees to build houses and newsprint paper, where we grow energy crops. Yeah, that's what we need to do. That's my vision. So all New Zealand, and then we can jump across the ditch and help Australia to solve their problem. And there are probably a lot of countries in the world who can benefit from this technology. I think in the past, we had these linear models. So we produce something, we use it, and whatever's lost, we put in the landfill, disappears. So that's called a linear model. So then we called it sustainable. So sustainable means we want to stay on the level where we are. Um, so we want to take whatever byproducts generated, we want to recycle them, not putting those in the landfill. And I think now it's changing. We want to have a circular business, circular economy, circular society. So everything needs to be encircled. In an ideal circle, you don't have any losses. And that's a challenge um, on its own. But, so we will always have some, 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 some kind of losses. And that's natural. But we want to reduce this as much as we can. By doing so, we don't want to use more resources to recover some resources. So sometimes you will find we spend a heck of a lot of money to solve a minor problem with a lot of other resources. So again, if we have, um, say, a huge expensive thermal composting plant, these new standards, so concrete, nice building, uh, big machines uh, turning around, then air filters because it's smelly, and then you still have, end up with a lot of product. 
And all these resources we can save. We can just say, well, let's step back. Innovation is making it easier, simplifying it, rather than more complicated and creating another problem and another problem we need to solve it. From a scientific point of view, that's challenging, that's cool, but I want to work the other way around. I want to simplify things to make it even, even more efficient. I think that's where we're operating on. And by integrating it, we want to have it regional, so we don't want to spend lots of energy to transport it to a centralised facility. The farm around the door can actually manage this with our help. And then we process it and on the farm it's integrated, the farmer can use it, some of the product can go back to other regions. And I think that's much smarter and you can adjust things. You can grow it overnight and you can reduce it again so it's fully scalable and, and, and while doing that we create a lot of job opportunities and meaningful jobs. Um, yeah. That's what I think is, is circular economy and then getting people involved as well. The economics of this uh, whole yeah. operation. So um, um, we need to differentiate a bit. So first of all, it's called CapEx. So how much money do you need to build a processing plant? So usually we have kind of three technologies. So forget about landfilling. This is probably phasing out. Um, so we have thermal composting. And we need, we're looking here at commercial composting, like one of these buildings, concrete, housing, um, technology driven to ensure we have the high temperatures and, and, and over time and uh, air filters and the whole thing. Um, they are going to be big. And so costs are about 250 euros per ton because we don't have any of these in New Zealand. So I need to go back to Europe. So per ton intake, it's about 260 euros a ton you build one. Um, so 100,000 tons uh, per year means 26 million dollars for one of these plants. So that's quite significant. Um, then the next one is an aerobic digester. So they just built somewhere here in the region for taking in 70,000 tons. Only food waste. So we're not talking about paper waste or um, let's say your cardboard and and, and bones and, and muscle shells and, and, and bamboo sticks. They can't process it in an aerobic digester. So 70,000 tons cost about 40, maybe probably 45 million by now. So that's a lot of money as well. A worm farm, and the largest one we're operating, is 150,000 tons intake per year. So larger of, of all the others. And investment is about $2 million in total. So that's absolutely stunning because the only thing we need is a kind of a kitchen, a reception area, it's a concrete pad. We don't need a roof on top. Um, just agriculture machines to do the mixing, a bit of facilities on the site, and then we're operating on farmland. So the footprint is pretty small for 150,000 tons. It's a hectare for the reception area, and the rest is happening on the worm farm, which is integrated in farm management. It's like a dairy plant is where you make milk powder, cheese and yogurt and stuff. The footprint is pretty small, but the dairy farming actually happening out on this pasture where these millions of cows are grazing. So we don't account this as a footprint for the dairy farm, for the dairy plant. So the same in vermicasting, just reverse. So we're receiving the product, processing it, making our sandwich for the worm and then bringing it out to the worm farm. So that's the cost. So the operation costs are much lower too, because worm farming reduces the volume by 80%. Only 20% we need to pick up, screen and apply it onto farmland. The other facilities, uh, thermocomposting, maximum a third volume reduction. To two thirds up to the total volume need to be brought out back onto farmland. Anaerobic digestion, you usually increase the volume because you have to add water to the organic waste. So you have more liquid fertilizer you need to apply onto farmland. And you can't apply this in winter, so you have to store it. Vermicast you can apply in winter. So there's a lot of economic benefits of doing the vermicomposting. It's fully scalable, so you don't need to come up how much waste do I need to process here on site because we can double it within a year easy, we can cut it all the way back to 10% and it doesn't do any any harm. So you're not um, committed to a certain um, volume which can give you kind of a lock-in 
agreement for 20, 30 years, so you have to deliver this type of waste, otherwise the whole investment is falling over. From a business point of view, we need to look at our revenues and our operational cost to make a profit, as in any other business. So we have two income sources. One is the, we call it a gate fee, so when we're receiving some organic resources, and the other is what we can, um, can sell it for. So these are the two income streams to cover our operational costs. Um, we are well below our landfill cost and if you look at the external effects on direct land application of some liquid waste uh, with all the negative effects on the environment, cleaning up rivers and lakes, the true cost for the, for the society, the economic costs, are much, much lower than the high-tech uh, solutions. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's the way forward, probably at least for the next 10, 20 years. And while we are studying and finding other, other ways, maybe we, we stick with it. We're just optimizing it over time. The main barriers are on different levels. So at the moment we're operating on five worm farms, but we want to get up to 20. And to do this in New Zealand, so we only two islands in the South Pacific. Um, we have 10 regions and I need a resource consent in every region. Even with different worm farms in the region, every time I need a resource consent. And um, so um, the Resource Management Act and consulting with EWI is very time consuming for good reason because what we're doing can have effect on the environment and we want to mitigate this. So it makes completely sense. But once you have approved it in New Zealand and we know it's working well, why do I need to have to do this 20 times from the scratch up? It always costs ten thousands of dollars, many, many months of time. To, to get this through the process. Um, it's like you would have a driver's license for Auckland, you need a driver's license for Hamilton and the Bay of Plenty and, and Canterbury. So once the system is kind of uh, understood, we need to look at local effects, like on rivers, on groundwater and different type of soils, absolutely. But 80% of the technology should be approved New Zealand wide. So this would be help us to overcome. This is one barrier and the other one is kind of getting the message out, educating people there is something else other than um, anaerobic digestion, thermal composting and of course landfilling. We should stop it anyway, organic waste to landfill. Looking at the RMA, which is the Resource Management Act in New Zealand, so this is designed that whatever we do we understand if there is any risk to the environment meaning to air, groundwater, soil, and to uh, plants, animals, and us as a human. So we want to make sure that this is all understood. So this is where we do a lot of research and, 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 and monitoring the effect of what we're doing. So the Region Council and landowners and iwi can truly um, understand what we are doing and comparing with other alternatives and, and opportunities while we are constantly improving and um, our technology. So when we first approach people and say, why don't we choose worm farming or vermicomposting as an alternative to the currently mainstream technology of organic waste processing? We often run into barrier that say, oh, you mean worm farming? How do you want to process 100,000 tons near one of our cities? So for for biosolids, for paper waste, for food waste. How can you do this and how do you upscale it? How does it work? Um, have you any proof? We never heard about this. Um, and you can do this for less than 10% of the cost for establishing one of these plants. It's, we're looking at disbelieving people because they don't believe that this is possible. But I think that's a problem. We are, we're looking at a big problem can only be solved with, with, with a huge effort in developing new technologies, new IPs and spending a lot of capital to make this work and or just a bit better. But instead of we should step back a little bit and look, what are we actually doing? Why, how has this been done 100 years ago or 200 years ago? Why wasn't there any of these kind of problems this time these areas because we were working with nature and, and implementing it. So coming back to the simple solution is sometimes too easy.
So another barrier is um, are people actually don't believe us that worm farming, earthworms, can manage a million ton a year. Um, of course, not. we don't need a giant earthworm and we just need a few billion of those to do the job. But that's actually an advantage. And we look at the worm, they're eating all the organic waste and they reduce the volume by 80% and we just have a worm casting which is safe, which is easy to apply in nature. There's no waste generated in the whole process. The worms are extracting the nitrogen out of the organic waste because they build up a lot of worm, worm, worm itself. So worm tissue, if you like, or worm meal, or uh, which is a lot of protein. So all the nitrogen is captured in here. So taking out of the equation. So you don't create problems. You are kind of it's it's a natural path of solving a problem. You put organic food into a worm. The worms are growing, multiplying, taking out all the nutrients which could damage the environment. And then they're releasing a tiny little bit, which is very sustainable and, and very important to the soil microorganism in the soil and to feed the plants. And there is no loss. This is fully sustainable. This is fully regenerating the soil function, keeping everything in the system. This is the technology um, nature came up with 460 million years ago and put it all into a five centimeter long tube. So now we are going to take organic waste and we're building a huge facility, an anaerobic digester, and so we have to cut it down in pieces and we have to dilute it with water and a lot of stuff the world, these digesters can't process. So we're putting a huge concrete thing which is covered with, 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 with a lid to capture all this methane then um, <clears throat> this volume need to be turned around and need to be heated to make sure it's all processed. Then once it's done, it's pumped out into another holding tank, which is still releasing methane, so it need to be covered. And then at some stage, this can be applied onto farmland. So we need to have special tank wagons and need to be injected into the soil while having a lot of problems in the soil, like a lot of nitrogen going into the groundwater, into the atmosphere, soil become more acidic, lots of transport, compaction of the soil. So instead of we solving, we believe we're solving one problem, we gain a bit of methane energy from, from this, but the energy we're putting in was transport in and transport out and building this huge concrete plant is not solving a real problem. We are shifting one problem to the end where the digest it, the sludge coming out of this need to be looked after. And this is probably more difficult to apply than deal with the original waste. So we can cut all this, this kind of super technology which is not solving a real problem while just adding it, feeding it to a worm. And it's coming up with the, with the concept, how do we implement this? without making it too complicated. And what I found out is the easier we can make it, the more fun it is and the less impact we have on the environment. So instead of having a huge centralized plant, which is difficult to control, breaking it down in smaller ones and applying on different areas where we need it to, it's just so simple. Simplicity is, is what we need to make life easier rather than complicating it. Because complicating it, it's, it's very costly. We depend on resources. We have to develop it. We might create other problems which are linked to it. And especially in the last two or three years, we found out we so much depend on external inputs like transport, like energy, like other resources, fertilizers, and we all have it on hand. And worm farming almost comes at no cost because we only need to feed the worms. They do the job for free. Yeah. And that's, that's mind blowing. And they utilize everything to the best. So what is super encouraging for me is that people are reaching out for us. So those people who actually find out about what we're doing, they want to connect with us. They want to be part of it. They can see the benefits. And while having the big vision in mind, it's a day-to-day -day business and, and we are, we're seeing so much positive feedback from the end users, the farmers who want to use a product and want to have more products. Farmers who are kind of, there's a waiting list for, 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 for farmers to join the program. 
there are organic waste producers, industry and councils who want to, want our service, want to send the, the organic resources to us. And this is keeping us so busy at the moment and this is so fulfilling. It's just, I think we can do it, yeah. And we will do it actually. We will, we will achieve our goals. So the journey we have been through over the last 15 years, it was a kind of an uplift, and there was a plateau and another uplift and another plateau, which is kind of these kind of barriers or when you, when you review uh, your situation and, and come up with new ideas, so doing research and then finding out what other industrial waste you can actually add to the feedstock to the worms from the um, abattoir industry, for example. Um, so this is kind of where I could actually adding on more things to my vision. So the first was, okay, I will get the first pulp mills, um, organic waste free. And then I thought, oh, let's do all five of them. And the, the, the Central North Island organic waste free and small communities. And then developing idea, how can we actually um, do this on the South Island without building a pulp mill first? Um, which is very expensive. So we figured out we have other carbon sources for the worms, like paper, paper waste, which is going to landfill anyway. So we figured out how this works. So then the vision went up to the next level. Oh, we can do this New Zealand-wide and then internationally. Um, but it all comes back to the people on the team. And so our team here, we're working almost horizontal. So we're working on a team, so the loaded tractor driver are talking to us and incorporated in our, in our new development of new ideas concept was, was supported directors. Uh, rather than having, oh, you need to find a solution and we are very vertical structured. So this is where I think I make, made a huge difference. With the right people on the team and everyone is fully engaged, I think that's, that's driving us.